very um, familiar text, and yet I want to show you some things today that may not be so familiar that will take us into a deeper understanding of not only who God is, but a deeper understanding of our worship of the God of his word. So I want to start by talking today about seeing signs and wondering what they mean, right? Um, just, I, I'm thinking about, um, I had a conversation with somebody just the other day, and it was really kind of interesting that I was, I was, ta- I was looking at somebody's obituary from many years ago, and it was interesting that they were born and died on the same day. You go, hmm, I wonder if there's any significance in that. Uh, another illustration I can think of is, is my son, Joel, who's been with the Lord uh, for tw- over 20 years now. Um, he happened to have the same birthday as a dear brother in Christ's son. And we kind of are always wondering, is there any significance in that? Okay, right? So there's certain things in our lives that we wonder if there's any significance. Well, I want to tie that in with the idea of signs from the Gospel of John in 2031, where it says these things were written that, that, that those who saw the signs might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing, they might have life in his name. Well, for us, signs may be just accidental or somewhat coincidental that really have no significance. But for Jesus, his signs had a purpose, and we're going to see that even today, okay? So I want to talk about the idea that Nicodemus sees the signs of Jesus and comes to a place of wonder. And what I want to talk about is the idea, I want to connect the flow of thought in the Gospel of John, because often we will read individual sections of it disconnected, or or we'll hear sermons preached that are disconnected. But I want us to see that there's a flow of thought in the Gospel of John that what happened before in the previous text has a clear connection to what happens to Nicodemus. I'll take us there in a minute. But let's go ahead and I want to read starting in verse 23. Chapter 2, 23 through 38. This is what the Gospel of John tells us. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast... Many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in a man. Verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, We know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. Can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So this morning, I want us to look at three things in the text. And the question I want to ask is two questions. What is Nicodemus' response to the signs? And then what is Jesus' response to Nicodemus' response? Okay? So if you look back in 23 through 32, it's what I'm titling the prompting of the kingdom. So we're going to talk about the kingdom. And there's some prompting that's going on with Nicodemus and others, okay? So it's interesting, in verse 23, 24, and 25, we're told that Jesus has actually done miraculous, all kinds of signs. It's in the plural, okay? Up to this point, the only sign that we've seen him do is the wedding 
miracle in Cana. But John very clearly says that he was doing, performing other signs. Okay. Now, as you go through the Gospel of John, there are only seven recorded signs. Which means that the, these are signs that he's doing at the Passover, along with the, the miracle of Cana, that are not recorded. Later on in the Gospel of John, it talks about if, if, Jesus, if all the miracles that Jesus had done had been recorded, there wouldn't be enough books to contain them. So these are the unrecorded signs that Jesus is doing. Now watch what's happening. Watch what's happening. Okay? They're believing in his name as they watch his signs. But, look at the contrast in verse 24. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them because he knew all men. Okay? Um, here's what's going on. The question is, do they really believe in him? It says they believe in his name. Okay? They believe in his character, uh, probably believing that there would be signs that would accompany Messiah. So they're probably put, putting two and two together and going, well, he's doing signs, therefore he must be the Messiah. But Jesus doesn't entrust himself. He doesn't trust what they're saying about him. Okay? Why? Because in verse 25, he says he doesn't need men to testify him because he knows what was in men. He knows what was in men. He knows whether those people are truly believers. And that's the question I ask myself in this text because later on, in John 6, 64, and John 8, 30 to 35, there are two groups of people who claim to believe in him, and yet he rebukes them and shows us from the text that they're not really believers. So the question is, what are they believing in? Are they believing in him because of the signs alone? Is this genuine faith? I would argue, and you can go back and look at it yourself, I would argue that he's questioning whether or not they're really putting their faith in him. What are they putting their faith in? His miracles? Or are they putting his faith in truly the idea of his identity as being the Messiah and sons of God? Now, this is interesting. Look at what, at the end of verse 25, it says, For he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. And then it goes on to say there was a man. So it goes from the idea of men in general to Nicodemus, very specifically. Okay? Now, this is really interesting. I believe when he comes to Jesus in 3.1, listen to what he says. Now, there's a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, he's a Pharisee, but he's part of the ruling class. There were 70 in the ruling class of the leaders of Israel called the Sanhedrin. Okay, 70 men, the council. Jesus is going to encounter them later on at his crucifixion. But he's now going to encounter one of them very specifically who comes from the, the, the leaders, okay? And what we, what we see is on the heels of what just happened, right? Remember he cleans the temple? So early on we see that Jesus is not going to be very popular with the religious leaders. And as we walk through the Gospel of John, you're going to see the conflict that is beginning to develop even early on with them. But we know that there are some in the Sanhedrin who are at least open to hearing what Jesus has to say. This is the first indication of that in chapter 3. So he comes from the ruling council. Now watch this. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you've come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs unless God is with him. So he comes... And he says, he comes by night, so the question is, why does he come at night? Okay, there's been a lot of speculations in messages and preaching over the years why he came. Well, the reality is the text doesn't tell us. And so what, do, what have I told you as students, inductive students, that you never do when the answer is not there? You don't speculate on the text. We don't know for sure, but there's some possible reasons why he could have come at night. First of all, uh, because of fear. John 7, 13 said there were those who were believing, but they did not confess Jesus openly because of the fear of the religious leaders. So they were believing in him, but so that could be one possible reason. Okay? Um, could it be that Jesus was busy with his ministry schedule during the day, and Nicodemus knows that if he comes at night, that he'd get a one-on-one -on -one with him? 
There's possible reasons we don't know for sure. And what I think is interesting is what draws Nicodemus to Jesus? John 6, 44. If you write that down and look at that. It's really interesting because later on in Jesus has a dialogue after his feeding of the 5,000. He has a dialogue with these people who he rebukes just like he kind of rebukes man here for the idea that you really only are believing in who I am because of the miracle. Take away the miracle, you don't really believe in me. So later on, he's rebuking this crowd that's following him that basically he says, the only reason you're following is, be, is because I fed you, because I did a miracle. You don't really believe, right? And in the middle of that dialogue in 644, Jesus says, nobody can come to me unless the Father draws him. That's a really interesting theological statement. Let me just, let me give you some quick application. You ever wondered why you've been sharing the gospel with people for a long time and it, feel like, it feels like you're butting your head against a brick wall because they don't listen? John 6, says, well, maybe Jesus is, the Father isn't drawing them at that point. He says, the only way you can come to Jesus and understand who he truly is and have faith in, in him genuinely as Messiah is unless the Father draws you. Well, clearly, what was going on here? Nicodemus was being drawn by the signs. And what's contrasted between Nicodemus and the other people that Jesus wasn't trusting was, is there something in Nicodemus that's different from the others who are just believing in him simply because he's a miracle worker. And that's where the heart of the conversation ends up. And you're going to see that in a minute because it's always bothered me why Jesus answers him the way he does, right? He doesn't even answer his question. He doesn't, he said, you know, because he says, well, we know that you are from God because you, you can do miracles. Well, first of all, who's the we? Notice he doesn't say I. I have recognized you as coming from God because you can do miracles. He says, we, who's the we? Well, I doubt it's the whole Sanhedrin because he's already ticked off the Sanhedrin with what he's done in the temple. So I doubt it's the whole ruling class. The we, many people believe, is a small group of religious leaders who are at least open to hearing what Jesus has or sympathetic to what Jesus is doing in terms of the signs. And, and he comes as a representative for the others saying, we believe that you are a teacher. You're a rabbi. We believe you're from God, right? We know you're a teacher. We, we know you represent God because of the miracles that you do. And what's interesting is there was a, a, a genuine belief among the Jews at that time that Messiah would come with accompanying miracles. Okay, so if you want to find Messiah you got to watch somebody who's doing miracles. But they were watching him carefully, all right? So, this is interesting, okay? So, watch what happens next in verse 3. It's what I'm calling perceiving the kingdom. So, next, okay, so he says, Jesus says to him on the heels of, we know who you are. We know you come from God. I, I just think Jesus' dialogue is so interesting he doesn't say, well, thank you for recognizing me. He immediately goes to the spiritual heart of the matter with Nicodemus. Okay? Because he knows man's heart. He goes after him. He says, Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly. By the way, that's a significant word. In, it means, it means um, I who am the truth say so. And he says it twice. It's emphatic in the Greek. Truly, truly. Which means I who am truth verify this fact. You can trust me with it. Truly, truly, I say to you, here's a religious leader. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Interesting. Interesting. Okay? So why does Jesus respond the way he does to Nicodemus? This is, I'm titling this, this uh, particular verse, Perceiving the Kingdom. Okay? Here's what I think he's telling him. It's, it's interesting because the word see here is a different word later on to verse 4 when he says you cannot enter into the kingdom. So the word see and enter are two different Greek words. Why? Because I think there's some significance to it. Here, he's talking about being able to 
experience the kingdom because you perceive the kingdom. You understand the kingdom. Okay? So he says, he's telling him, you cannot, you cannot understand the kingdom of God because you're not in a particular spiritual state. This is why you are a religious leader, but you still don't get it. Right? Because there's something in you, or should I say something that's not in you, that's keeping you from perceiving and experiencing the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see, he cannot understand. Listen to, listen to this. What he's saying, I think, is unless a person has received from God a new spiritual life or inward nature, they cannot know or understand the spiritual things about the spiritual rule or kingdom on earth among believers. Okay, so he's talking about the, the already and the not yet kingdom. Right? So it's a kingdom that's being established through Jesus. And how is it being established? The preaching of the kingdom in the Gospels says, Repent for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. So to enter, we're going to see that in a minute, has to do with repentance. Okay? In order to enter it. But you can't enter it until you begin to understand what the kingdom is about. Right? And, and he's, he says, you, you don't get it. You can't understand unless you're changed inwardly, unless you are inwardly changed. Now, what's going on? When he, what does he mean when he says you cannot understand or you can't experience it until you've been born again? Well, this is an inward spiritual transformation that takes a person out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. Okay? We are born, we are born in a lost spiritual state. Did you know that? Did you know? I, I, I had somebody tell me one time at a church. I could not believe it. Um, I asked this individual. He was actually a deacon of a church in Kansas years ago. I, I said, so when did you become a Christian? He said, well, I was born a Christian. You're a leader of the church and you believe you were born a Christian? Whoa, I was a seminary student. This guy was in like his 60s and 70s. It was like, no, oh, do I want to even touch this one? You know, what, what's an older gentleman going to listen to this young buck? But spiritually, the guy was not born again, right? If you think you're born that way, why? Because, because I think, I believe, this is my contention, that man's spiritual state gets changed in the garden. I believe man was, was given the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God was breathed into him. If you look at Genesis 2-7. When he created Adam, it says what? He says he breathed his ruach. He, he breathed his spirit, his life, God's life into man. So Adam and Eve were born spiritually in the right place. They had a right relationship with God. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. If you go to, Ephesians, if you go to uh, Genesis 5, 1 through 3, after Cain kills Abel, their next baby that's born it says it was born after the spirit of daddy, not the spirit of God, right? It had, it had father's flesh nature, okay? Which means that I believe that what happened when Adam and Eve sinned is they lost the spirit of God living within them. They lost the ability to live a life pleasing to God and now had their own sin nature, Okay? Uh, Genesis chapter 5. Just look at that real quickly. This is really important to understand. Okay? Um, it says in verse 2, he created them male and female, blessed them, right? Then in verse 3, it says, When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, becoming according to his image. And then if you jump over to Romans 5, 12, we're told that when death entered because of sin... Death entered to all men. We are all born in a dead state, according to uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. We are born in a dead state. So why is he saying to Nicodemus, you've got to be born again? Because when you're born the first time, you're born into the natural man, and you're born into the kingdom of darkness. You're under Satan's domain and not God's. So in order to be uh, understand the kingdom and come into the kingdom of God, God's rule, you have to be taken out of one and put into the other. Well, how does that happen? In John 1, 12 and 13. It says, those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become 
children of God. Born how? Not of a natural descent, but born of the Spirit. Right? John's already told us that in John 1. Colossians 1.13, 1 Peter 2.23. Our old nature needs to be changed because we are born what? Spiritually dead. You know, does anybody get that? We're born spiritually dead. Here's the problem. Here's the problem with a lot of people today. We were talking uh, Tuesday night in Bible study about why people don't believe in Jesus, why people are willing to risk their eternity because they reject the gospel, right? They, they, and, and I was talking to somebody yesterday about it as well. They don't understand. They don't get it. They don't understand the significance of it, right? Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, we're told that flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's Paul talking about the resurrection, right? So if flesh can't inherit the kingdom of God, what can? The spirit, the spiritual nature is the only thing that can, can inherit the kingdom of God. And if you're not changed and you're not born again or born anew or born from above and you remain in that natural state, here's what happens to you according to John 3, 36. You have been judged already, but one day when you die and your nature hasn't changed through trusting in Christ alone, um, then you will be sent to prison forever and ever and ever. You will be under God's eternal judgment. See, here's the problem with most people today. They'll look at you and say, well, I'm not that bad. How many times have you tried witnessing to the gospel to people and they say, well, I I'm just not that bad. Or how many of us grew up hearing this? Oh, Jimmy, you know, people used to pat me on the head when I was six years old. That was, what, how many years ago now? Fifty-six years ago. Used to pat me on the head and say, Jimmy, just, just, let your, just be a good boy. Just let your good outweigh your bad, and you'll be right with God. It was almost like God had an accounting book. And if my good was good enough and it outweighed my bad, by the skin of my teeth, I might get to heaven. Show me in Scripture where anything in our good works gets us to heaven. The Bible clearly says nothing, nothing, nothing in us causes God to give us eternal life. We must be born again. You see what Nicodemus... Now, why would he say this to Nicodemus? Who was Nicodemus? He was a Pharisee. What did the Pharisees bank on? The outward, the external, keeping the law. Jesus is saying to him, listen, you're a keeper of the law. And Nicodemus, you might be good at what you do. But Nicodemus, I'm here to tell you that keeping the law is not what gets you to see the kingdom of God. It is only by inwardly being changed because Nicodemus, as good as you look, I'm here to tell you, your righteous deeds, according to Isaiah, are like filthy rags in God's sight. Here's the thing when we preach the gospel to people. we got to tell them, you're a bunch of filthy rags. And they'll go, but I'm offended by that. You know what? I'll include myself in that. I'm a bunch of filthy rags as well, apart from Jesus Christ. And that's what he's trying to get Nicodemus to understand, right? You have a law. You're born, in, you're born in sin. You're born dead. You've got to be changed because you're spiritually dead. You need to be made alive. What does it mean to be born again? Titus 3.5. It means to begin anew in a relationship to God or regeneration that God imparts by the Holy Spirit to those who believe and trust Him. It's a regeneration. It's a regeneration. Inwardly, Nicodemus would have understood about regeneration. You're a teacher of the law. Why don't you understand these things? You should understand the idea of regeneration, the idea of being able to see the kingdom of God. We need a, a new spiritual nature so that we can see the things of God. And I've already quoted 1 Corinthians 2, 14, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, right? We cannot see things spiritually because we're dead. Dead people don't see spiritual things. How many of you can relate back to that before you were saved? You couldn't understand spiritual things. You couldn't get what people were talking about because you didn't have spiritual eyes by the Spirit. Right? The, and, and let me give it in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be what? In Christ, he's a new creation. That goes back to what Jesus is talking about. You need to be made new. 
here's the thing. The Bible begins to make sense with new spiritual eyes. Before I was saved, and I think I've shared this with you before, but before I was saved, I would read the Bible. Absolutely did not make sense. Now, I'm not the smartest, you know, uh, smartest one in the, in the lot, but I wasn't dumb either. I would read stuff and just not get it. Why? This Bible began to make sense to me because I was born again now in 1984. I had a new set of eyes, and that's what he's telling Nicodemus. You need new eyes. You're not going to get it. You won't perceive what the kingdom is about. You think it's about keeping laws. You think it's about external righteousness. And he's going, no. Why? Because Romans 3 says what? And it quotes the Psalms starting in 310. No one is righteous. No, not one. Nobody seeks after God. Do you get that? And until somebody who's lost begins to understand that, they're not going to think they need to be saved. I'm good with God. And you know what grieves me? I was telling somebody this recently. As we've been studying the judgment of God in Revelation on Tuesday nights, it's really begun to grieve my spirit. I used to think, you know, okay, they got the gospel. They've heard it. If they reject it, well, you know, then whatever. Whatever. I don't think that way anymore. I'm grieved over my loved ones whose eyes haven't been opened. I'm grieved over the people who I know who do not know Jesus Christ. And if they do not get changed inwardly, they will spend eternity away from God under his wrath. That grieves me today. Does it grieve us? There are people in church Church here, churches who are religious, who are like Nicodemus, who are all about the external. Look at me. Look at what I've done. And Jesus says, those are filthy rags. You've got to be changed inwardly. Now watch what he goes on to say in verses 4 through 8. we got the perceiving of the kingdom. Now we see the partaking of the kingdom using the word enter. Okay? So Nicodemus is thinking through spiritual eyes. Now watch what happens. So Nicodemus responds to him and says, how can a man be born when he's old? Okay, I'm, 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 I'm not connecting with that Jesus. I don't get it, right? He cannot enter a, a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And one of the commentators says something about, well, he's not talking about reincarnation. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's, the, the commentator even said, I doubt that Nicodemus really even thought that it was possible to get into my mother's womb again, especially as an old man. There's something here about him not understanding regeneration, inward regeneration. Okay? So Nicodemus is thinking through the eyes of a natural man when he says to Jesus, how is this possible? Why? This is evidence that he's not born again because he doesn't has no spiritual eyes to understand. He's thinking through the natural. If he were born again and his eyes and his inward spirit were changed by the Spirit of God, he would be able to understand. But because he's not, he's the natural man. Second, 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit. But guess what? The spiritual man should. You know what grieves me? among people who call themselves Christians? Well, I read the Bible and I don't understand it. Really? Don't you have the Holy Spirit inside of you? Now, it may not mean you understand it in its complexity, but you don't understand what God's word is saying on a simple surface level? That concerns me because are you really born again? Because God would allow you by his spirit. I mean, 1 Corinthians tells us that. The reason you couldn't understand before was because the, the devil had your eyes blinded. Well, your eyes are no longer blinded. You can see. You should be able to see. Now watch this. You may not be able to see in full depth. But come on. When I got saved, how much knowledge did I have of God's word when I got saved? Very little. Very little understanding. When I first got saved in the first few years, I didn't go very deep with God at all. But at least I understood some of the basic stuff. That spiritual growth and the understanding of the Spirit's eyes opening us up to his truth, 
that comes along the way, right? So he's, he's, okay, so he says, unless, now watch this, he goes on to define what it means to be born again. Jesus answered in verse 5, truly, truly, again, here we go, truly, truly, you can bank on this, you can trust me, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So before, it's not just this idea of uh, uh, perceiving the kingdom, but now it's enter into the kingdom. So you got to have both. you got to have the, the understanding, and then, then the, this is how you enter the kingdom. I love it. He says you cannot enter unless you are born of water and spirit. So he goes on to define the idea of being born again. Okay? Now, this is really interesting because you say, well, what does he mean by being born of water and spirit? Okay? This is one that commentators have fun with because as I looked at uh, some of the commentators, there are five possible explanations to what Jesus could possibly be meaning when he says you've got to be born of water and spirit. The most prominent one that we would think of is, because since he's talking about birth here, would be the natural versus the supernatural. The first birth, right, being born, water, you come out of the water, right, amniotic flat, uh, fluid, you come out of mama's womb, Right? That would be the natural birth, and then the spiritual birth would be has to do with the spirit. That's one possible explanation. Another is Jesus could be referring to water baptism. Well, we know he can't be referring to water baptism for two reasons. One is water baptism has been, hasn't been initiated yet in the New Testament. And secondly, we're told according to the New Testament, water has nothing to do with your salvation. It's just a sign of that salvation, just like the covenant sign of circumcision. So it can't be that, right? Here's another explanation, potentially. He could be talking about the Word of God, right? Ephesians 5.26, right, talks about being washed by the water of the Word, as it's talking about that um, illustration between Jesus and the church and the, and the husband and the wife. It talks about Christ, you know, washed him with the water of the Word. Well, the water could refer to the gospel here. That's a possibility. 2 Timothy 3.15 and 1 Peter 23 talks about being the word of God opening our eyes to salvation. 1 Peter 2.23, uh, one twenty three talks about the idea of being born again, you know, by, the, by that perfect seed. That could be the gospel, more than likely. So there's a possibility. Then, one of the commentators said it could be the idea of the repentance ministry of John the Baptist. Remember, when John came on the scene, he was baptizing in water, right? And the water baptism would be a symbol, symbol, symbol of purification and the symbol of repentance. So water could be here a reference to repentance before regeneration. Okay? And we see that in Scripture because we know that in order to be born again, you have to repent. It's not just enough to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. You have to repent and turn away from and turn to God through salvation. So it's possible that could be. The last one is the idea that the Holy Spirit uh, could be, the, the water could be the symbol of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, talks about the, under the new covenant. John 7, 38, uh, 37 and 38 talks about that. Titus 3, 5 uh, refers to that. And what's really interesting is in the Greek, this is interesting, this is how the Greek could read. Um, verse 5, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, this is how it could read in the Greek, even the Spirit. So the question is, could, could Jesus be using water and Spirit to talk about the Spirit? His act in that part of regeneration, Right? I tend to think, and I'm going to let you kind of figure this one out for yourself because you, you can't really know for sure, but I, I think that it's really one of the last two. I think it's the idea of that water representing the, the repentance that John was preaching because that lines up with the rest of the messages in the Gospels. You know, John, Jesus, even the, the disciples later on will have the same message, repent, repent. Repent. 
so that water could be symbolic of repentance before regeneration, or it could represent the Holy Spirit, you know, in terms of the work that he does in regeneration, okay? That's interesting. He says, unless that happens to you, you've been born of the water in the, in the flesh. So think about it. He could, any one of these could actually make sense. Not, not the water baptism, but he could be saying, listen, unless you're, unless you're born naturally and then born again spiritually, you can't enter the kingdom. Well, the reason why that one doesn't make sense is because we're all born naturally. It's not like you've got to go out and get born physically. You're already born. So that, that's why that one. But the last, I mean, even the word of God, unless you're born again through the gospel. How do we get born again? Through the gospel. Right? Repentance. Clearly a precursor to trusting Christ for salvation and being regenerated is to repent. This is why I think there's a lot of false conversions in churches today. And I'm not the, I'm, I, and by the way, I, I'm not the one that created that thought. Uh, people like Paul Washer and Dave Platt, David Platt have said that for years, that they believe there's a lot of false conversions in the church today because what's missing in the gospel presentation is repentance. Well, I believe Jesus died for my sins. Yeah, but you've never repented and turned away from that lifestyle and turned to his lifestyle. Because what does the end of 1 Thessalonians talk about? He's talking to the, the group of the believers in Thessalonica who had turned away from idols, repented, and turned to serve the living God. That's an issue of repentance. So repentance is an absolute critical issue in the idea of regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Right? And I think there's a lot of false conversions today because people think, well, I believe in Jesus. Really? But have you ever repented of your sins? Isn't that what Jesus said you need to do? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand? What did John say? Repent. The message was clear all the way through the book of Acts. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repentance is a key issue. How many people in churches today believe they're going to heaven but have never repented of their sin and they wonder why they're still living a sinful lifestyle? Gee whiz, could it be? Jesus is saying, you got it, Nicodemus, you've got to be born of the water of the Spirit. Now watch what he goes on to say. Finishes up in 6 and says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now, that's where in context you could go back and say, maybe he is talking about the natural birth versus the spiritual birth. Because immediately he contrasts the two states that any human being could be in, either the flesh or the spirit. By the way, I want you to know something, and this is something that has, has been on my heart for many years. I've met people who think there are three categories of people on earth. Lost people, saved people, and somewhere in between. I got half of my foot in the kingdom and half of my foot in the world. No, the Bible doesn't allow for that in the New Testament. You're either in one or you're in the other, right? Now, if you're born again, that doesn't mean that your life is perfect, but it means that it's consistently being led by the Spirit and so that you are showing forth the fruit of the Spirit. You can't be somewhere in between. So Jesus goes, he attacks that. He says, those who are born in the flesh are flesh, right? Those who are, haven't been converted, those who have not had that new spiritual nature regenerated in them, they're fleshly. And, and, and some good cross-references that go with that is Romans 8, 5 through 11, 8, 5 through 11. talks about that very essence. That if you're living according to the flesh, this is what your life's going to look like. If you're living according to the Spirit, you're able to do what? In verse 12, you're able to put to death the deeds of the flesh. There's a very big distinction, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 50. I've already alluded to that. There's, there's flesh that can't inherit the kingdom of God. Only the spirit man can enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying, listen, you're either one or the other. You're either in the flesh or you're in the spirit. Okay, But that which is born of the flesh is flesh, sinful nature. Evidence of it by the way we live consistently by the way, you don't have to convince me of that. If, if you could take a snapshot of my life in the first 23 years before, before August 12, 1984, you wouldn't have argued with Jesus about that at all. You could have looked at my life and said, boy, Jesus got that right. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. I was nothing but flesh. Flesh, 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 flesh. All about my desires. Back to Ephesians 2. That's what it was about. I wanted to indulge 
in the flesh, right? But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, spiritual, you're focused on the spiritual. And that doesn't mean that you're perfect, but it means that you are living in a consistent lifestyle under the power of the Holy Spirit to live and get rid of that sin in your life. And we were talking yesterday with a, a couple of my men online. And we were asking, we were talking about this whole idea of, you know, sanctification being a process, right? And, and we were talking about why we go through suffering. One of the reasons I'm convinced that believers go through suffering is to test our faith, right? And it reminds me of the, the idea of a silversmith. Have you, ever seen, have you ever seen or read anything about a silversmith? Where the silversmith will take the, the, the piece of silver and they'll put it in that little, uh, I, I forget what it's called, a uh, little cradle thing, metal, and they'll put it over the fire. And they heat it up, they heat it up seven times. And what's the purpose of, of, of doing that? It's to get rid of what? The impurities, the dross, so you can have pure silver, right? And then I remember one time somebody asking, well, how do you know when it's been heated up enough? When you can see the image of the silversmith in the, in the silver. Why does God allow testings in our life? To test us to see if our faith is genuine, according to 1 Peter, right? Doesn't mean we're perfect if we're spiritual, but it means that we are moving in that direction. We become more and more in the image of Jesus Christ every single day day and as like Christy said as we began the service I want to get rid of anything in my flesh that isn't of you Jesus that should be our heart's desire as spiritual beings right okay um, and again the Jews focused on the outward and the ritual and here's the question uh, according to that which is born of the flesh is flesh that which is born of the spirit is spirit what does each produce well the flesh produces what death right according to Romans 8 5 Produces death. What does the Spirit produce? Life. The fruit of the Spirit. Right? So Jesus is telling him, this is what you can understand. Then he, then he says this. This is interesting. One of the last things he says is, well, don't be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Don't be, don't be blown away by that. You should know better. This is God's requirement to enter the kingdom. As a religious leader, you should understand that. And then the last thing he says in verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born in the Spirit. He's going to use this illustration of the wind to explain the unexplainable. How do you explain the spiritual nature? How do you explain it? How, I mean, how do I know, Christy, that you have the Spirit in you? I can't unzip you and look. Oh, there's the Spirit. I can't do that, right? So how do we know What's the evidence that the spirit is in Christy or is in Jim or is in Fritz or whoever? How do we know? Jesus says, he uses an illustration. The wind. You don't know where the wind's going. By the way, when's the last time you visually saw the wind? You'll say, well, I saw the trees blowing. No, you didn't. You didn't see the wind. You saw the evidence of the wind. You and I can't see the wind. Just like the spirit. We can't see him because he's invisible. But you can see the evidence of the wind can we see the evidence of the wind in our spiritual lives by the holy spirit's regeneration and the way he's working and the other thing that i thought was really interesting as i studied this it's taught he was talking about the power of the wind the power of the wind wow go to ephesians 3 with me for a minute as we close out ephesians 3 this is so beautiful Ephesians chapter 3, starting in 14 through 21. Paul's praying for them. Right? And in verse 16, he says, I, I, I pray that he would grant you, that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with what? Power through the Holy Spirit in the inner man. So this is talking about inward spiritual sanctification and growth. So that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you might be filled up to the fullness of God. He's talking about God's power working within us spiritually. And then this is a verse that's often taken out of context. Now to him who was able to do far more abundantly 
beyond all we ask or think according to the power that works where? Within us. He's not talking about God's ability to uh, give a church a million dollars if they have a church campaign when they only have 50,000. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about inward power, not outward power. We see God working outwardly, but he's talking here inwardly, right? That he would do exceedingly more than we ask or imagine according to the power that works within us to him be the glory in the church in Christ Jesus through all generations, right? What's he talking about? He's talking about the power that works within us. The Holy Spirit, once he enters into us, begins to blow in our lives, and we begin to see the evidence outwardly. Wow. And you know what I think is a really cool thought? And this is just a, a little a side note. The word for wind and spirit in Greek is the same word. Pneuma, pneuma, P-N-E-E-U-M-A, pneuma. Same word. It's a play on words, not accidental. Okay, so let's finish it up. What does this all mean for us? Being born again with God imparting his life into believers is the prerequisite to understanding and entering into God's kingdom. This is where it has to begin. If you've been born again, you've entered into the kingdom and you will understand the things of God. If you have not been born again, you have not entered and will not understand, right? How can we use this to share the gospel? Well, we tell people what? You've got to be born again. I'll share this as I come to the table. Years ago, uh, I had gotten saved, and it was a couple of months after I'd gotten saved, I was in a Christian bookstore, and I walked in, and I saw a man in there that I did not expect to see. <laughs> he and I had both partied together. And I looked and I said, oh, you're a Christian? And he said, yeah, but I'm not one of those born again types. And I was so young in my faith, I, I was stunned. I didn't know what to say. And later on, he walked down and went, you can't be a Christian unless you're born again. Man. So this idea that yeah, I'm not one of those, yeah, I'm a born-again type and proud of it <laughs> by the power of God. As I come to the table, there's a phrase you probably heard me use before, but here's how it goes. Born once, die twice. 